Here's what's coming up on In Your Horizon. Well, when state lawmakers head back to the Capitol next week, they'll find a laundry list of problems. And at the very top is a looming budget shortfall approaching a billion dollars that could force some significant cuts. This week, we're going to look at education spending and the value our economy derives from it. The day when a lot of us could go do routine jobs in a blue collar or white collar uh, office space is, is gone. And so we're all having to upskill pretty rapidly just to keep pace with our, our modern economy. We'll talk with educators, economists, and industry leaders about the state of education in Oklahoma. You have to have a vibrant education system. Now, I'm not sure we can call ours a vibrant education system at this point. We'll look at various ways. Some say the state can save education dollars. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by CareerTech. A job for every Oklahoman and a workforce for every company. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. I'm Rob McClendon. Well, Oklahoma received a grade of D plus and a 46 ranking among the 50 states in Education Week's latest annual survey. The report called Quality Counts focuses on student outcomes, state spending, and educational opportunity. Now, despite these low marks, Oklahoma actually improved its national ranking from 48th to 46th. State Superintendent Joy Hoffmeister says the results came as no surprise. In a written statement, Hoffmeister said, we will not see anything different until we do something different. The Quality Counts report is a stark reminder that we cannot progress in education without a full commitment to a better plan and the resources to execute it. And it is those resources where we begin today. Since 2008, Oklahoma leads the nation for the largest cuts of dollars used directly in the classroom. If I can, I want to show you exactly what I'm talking about. And these numbers are from a report from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And what you see here, all these states in red, well, they've all cut education spending. But none have cut more than Oklahoma. For example, Texas has cut by about 10%. But after you figure in inflation, Oklahoma's general education funding per student is down by 24.2%. Now, nationally, we did go through a great recession that actually started way back in 2007 and went midway through about 2009. And that national downturn translated into some across-the-board cuts on the state level, including education. But Oklahoma was one of the first states to recover from what's been called the Great Recession, thanks in great part to our booming energy economy. And here is why I point that out. When you look at this list, you go down to the very bottom, there is North Dakota. Now, if you remember, that is the state that for some of those same years was the only one outperforming ours thanks to their red hot energy economy. So while we were making cuts to education spending during those boom years to a tune of about 24.2%, they in turn were increasing spending by 25.9%. So what does that mean in true dollar terms? Well, total appropriations for Oklahoma public schools is $173 million below what it was in fiscal year 2008. And while local ad valorem taxes, those taxes most all property owners pay, did increase in that same period, it's not enough to make up for the state cuts. So when you combine local property taxes and state funding per student spending in Oklahoma has dropped by roughly 10.1% after inflation. A bigger cut than all but eight other states. And in our region, when it comes to per pupil spending, we're also bringing up the rear. Ann Kane is with the Oklahoma State School Board Association. 
The Oklahoma Center for Ed Statistics uh, just published a document that shows when you think about surrounding states, so we hate to be behind Texas, but for us to spend what Texas spends on funding per pupil, we would need over $900 million. Kansas, for us to catch up to Kansas on funding per pupil, we would need $2 billion additionally. Now here's how we stack up when it comes to per pupil funding in the region. Kansas tops the list, spending $11,849 per pupil, followed by Arkansas, New Mexico, and Texas, with Oklahoma a distant fifth with per pupil expenditures of $8,631. When you figure in how many students they have in Texas, they're spending almost a billion themselves more on those children than we are. And Kansas with two billion and they have fewer students than we do. Which means more money is going into the classroom to fund each of those students. A mismatch in funding that many worry could have a long-term impact on our economy. Jim Hunsinger is the Bank of Oklahoma's financial chief investment officer and follows economic trends for a living. I think first and foremost would be infrastructure and education. Those two things are vitally important. Um, you have to have uh, the roads, the schools, um, the the unglamorous thing like sewer systems and water supplies. You have to have all of those things in place and then you have to have a vibrant education system. And I'm not sure we can call ours a vibrant education system at this point and it really needs to be in order for us to excel. Now some will argue that when you put a cost-benefit ratio to education funding in Oklahoma you actually get more bang for the buck when it comes to student attainment. But this is an issue that goes well beyond which state has the highest test scores. When we return, we'll examine the gap between student outcomes and industry needs. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon with Rob McClendon. Weekly insight into your changing world. Well, large cuts in state education spending could have serious consequences for our economy in both the short and long term. Local school districts typically have little ability to make up for lost state funding on their own. So, as a result, deep state funding cuts can lead to job losses, slowing a local economy in the short term. But it's often down the road where the larger impact may be felt. Such cuts also counteract and sometimes undermine important state education reforms and initiatives at a time when producing workers with high-level technical and analytical skills are increasingly important to our state's prosperity. Joining me now is our Courtney May. Well, according to the Oklahoma Office of Workforce Development, 46% of Oklahomans have a high school diploma or less. Projections show that in 10 years, only 23% of the state's labor market will be available to those without some post-secondary training or education. This means we have a 23-point skills gap between what our current workforce has and what our future economy will support. In the fall of 2015, state leaders traveled across Oklahoma holding regional conversations between business, education, and workforce development, all in an effort to align education and training with the workforce needs of the state. Chuck Mills is the owner of Mills Machine Works and the former chairman for the State Chamber of Oklahoma. We've got to get our education uh, community really understanding how they fit, how they can prepare these kids or youth for that job, that job opening. And it starts again at, at earlier on, but it really right now at career tech, community college, and higher education are the keys for immediate success. In just a few short years, it will be increasingly harder and harder to find a living wage job without an industry recognized credential or college degree. Marcy Mack is the state director for the Oklahoma Department of Career Tech. In all of our programs that we have, we have the opportunity to integrate science, technology, engineering, and mathematics from our HVAC programs to our pre-engineering programs. We're very fortunate that those are components that are integrated throughout the curriculum and help individuals meet the need of filling the STEM positions that are available in Oklahoma. 
Career Tech offers training programs to high schoolers. The students can take classes at a technology center while working toward their high school diploma, allowing them to immediately enter the workforce and help fill the skills gap more rapidly. Career Tech is dedicated to making sure that we are offering programs that align with industry needs. Uh, one of our main goals are business and in industry partnerships to make sure that we are having active conversations with businesses to make sure as students go through our programs that we are providing them with the knowledge and skills and credentialing that they need to be a successful employee for the employers that we have. Garrett Groves is the Director of Economic Opportunity for the Center of Public Policy Priorities, and he says, gone are the days where a high school education alone is acceptable for certain jobs. We're talking about uh, the number of jobs and occupations that you can get without getting a bachelor's degree, but still require science, technology, math, and engineering skills beyond high school. John Winters is the Associate Professor of Economics at Oklahoma State University, and he says, in a 21st century economy, job seekers with STEM skills will be critical to the success of the state. STEM graduates are believed to be the special players in innovation. Uh, you know, they're the ones that, that uh, come up with new ideas and new products and processes. And so STEM graduates you know, also have a lot of skills, uh, quantitative and problem solving skills, uh, that makes them very valuable in the labor market. And so STEM graduates tend to have very, uh, much higher earnings than a lot of other college graduates. Uh, but STEM graduates are also maybe the ones that are uh, the most beneficial in many ways for state economy, because if we create new production processes and new jobs and, and, and such, um, then the STEM graduates can benefit other workers. Benefits that can translate into income across almost every industry. The, the old dirty manufacturing jobs don't exist. Now you have to have some sort of technical skill and some computer knowledge just to repair any kind of machine, yet alone run those and make sure they're operating optimally. So the day when a lot of us could go do routine jobs in a blue collar or white collar uh, office space is, is gone. And so we're all having to upskill pretty rapidly just to keep pace with our, our modern economy. And continually, because of evolving technology, education is increasingly a lifelong pursuit. We are an integral part of Oklahoma's economy and we make a substantial difference in making sure that we have a qualified workforce to move our state forward. And Winter says a local economy's success is linked to education and training, which leads to higher salaries, more people in the workforce, and higher taxes. Each additional year of higher education increases uh, one's wages by about 10 percentage points. Um, so if you get a college degree versus a high school, you're going to earn about 40 percent more per year. Uh, but obviously, depending on your field or specialty, it could end up being a lot more than that. The more STEM jobs and the more STEM educated individuals you have, the more likely that community or that economy is likely to grow its GDP, export more goods. Those individuals are likely to bring home more take home pay. Um, and unemployment's going to be lower. Um, so there's lots of correlations about why that's the case, but certainly the more STEM education that's available in the community, the more likely its economy is going to thrive. While any form of industry training or post-secondary education is expected to boost an individual's earning beyond what one could make with just a high school diploma, the true value of education has on the economy is training students for the jobs in high demand and making sure students are aware of the industry needs when furthering their education. So Courtney, what about those students that are coming out of school with a degree that's maybe not in high demand? What do they do? Right. Well, almost 40% of recent college graduates are either unemployed or underemployed, and many of them are working in jobs that doesn't even require a high school diploma. So it's so important for our educational leaders to inform these students about their degree plan and their career path and let them know what jobs are in high demand, but also let them know the jobs that are going to be few and far between to find when they graduate. All right. Thank you so much, Courtney. You're welcome, Rob. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, breaking the silence. The joke inside education is that, yes, education pays unless you're in education. But first, Oklahoma's teacher shortage. Well, when State Superintendent Joy Hoffmeister presented her agency's budget request to a Senate panel, despite lawmaker warnings to keep agency requests flat, 
you can see um, the request for 2617 is um, close to half a billion dollars of our budget is in the health care. Hofmeister asks for nearly $78 million in additional funding to keep per pupil spending flat and another $60 million for teacher pay raises. Hofmeister says any loss of funding will only acerbate the exodus of teachers to other states. We've got to work to have a competitive salary and that means that we are going to need to increase by $5,000 uh, to be competitive with our neighboring states. Uh, we are exporting great people through our colleges of education and they are not staying in our state and this is something that we must fix. In our continuing examination of the role education plays in our economy, our Blaine Singletary takes a closer look at the critical shortage of certified teachers in our state. Oklahoma's teacher shortage is becoming a statewide crisis. The 2015-2016 school year began with 1,000 vacant teaching positions and comes despite eliminating 600 positions in the previous school year. That means some classrooms simply didn't have teachers in them, and the teachers who were there may have been underqualified. Nearly 1,000 emergency teaching certificates were given out to help turn things around. These allow applicants who haven't passed certification to teach anyway. While there are concerns as to whether Oklahoma teacher preparation programs can put out enough teachers to meet this huge demand, the real issue at hand may be the way teachers get paid. Well, there's going to have to be some difficult decisions made, I think. That's Matt Hendricks, assistant professor at the University of Tulsa. He spoke about the teacher shortage at the 2015 Economic Outlook Conference and presented some troubling numbers from his research. Just in terms of numbers, if you moved, for example, from Tulsa to Dallas as a teacher, you can expect to make about 34% more. <laughs> Think about that for a second. According to Oklahoma Watch, teachers in the Sooner State can expect to have a starting salary of around $31,000 to $35,000. With cities like Dallas offering a $50,000 starting salary, it's easy to see why Oklahoma schools are having trouble finding and keeping talent. State legislators are attempting to sweeten the deal for potential teachers with two bills that went into effect on November 1st. Senate Bill 20 allows out-of-state certified teachers with five years experience to jump right into the classroom without any further certification. While House Bill 1521 offers one-time incentive pay for new teachers to return for a second year. But do these measures go far enough? I think the problem in education a lot of times, especially with teacher funding, is if it's a temporary program and teachers know that it's temporary, it's probably not going to have the same effects as if it were a permanent change to base salaries. With teacher attrition rates higher in Oklahoma relative to Texas, the best way to equalize this, in his words, would be to shift salary schedules up by 12%. Hendricks says that's probably the best way to get teachers to stick with Oklahoma, but it would have to be something lawmakers stick to as well. You wouldn't expect a, an increase in teacher salaries to have all of its impact initially, even in the first year. It, makes, it may take several years to see the full impact because the way it works, at least the mechanism I'm looking at, is that it reduces teacher attrition, which gradually over time increases the experience level of the teachers in the workforce. So that process of reaching a new steady state might take uh, two or three years even, or longer. Better salaries could boost the quantity and quality of teachers, but with an ever-growing budget hole causing everyone to cut back, how would public schools be able to sustain an increase like this? Hendricks provided another way to boost teacher productivity at no additional cost. Rather than increasing the salary schedules, it all comes down to reshaping them. Instead of having a convex structure that awards higher pay increases to more experienced teachers, you make it look more like the private sector where there's really steep initially and early career teachers get large annual increases in salary, whereas veteran teachers uh, get smaller if not uh, any increase in, in, in salary in subsequent years. Looking again to the Lone Star State, Hendricks says perhaps a more local focused funding model is necessary to support our students. We went out to visit with one of these local school leaders on the front lines of this funding and teacher shortage, Morrison Superintendent Jay Vernon. Schools are, are going to be put in a pretty bad uh, spot. Uh, we've 
generated more and more local money. Um, so I don't know how we're going to survive a lot of this. In this small rural school district, nowhere are these tighter funds felt more than in hiring good, qualified teachers. We need more support for our kids. And the only way to get more support for our kids is personnel. You know, we'd like to do more along the lines of computer programming, but try to hire somebody who has the abilities to reach kids and teach that. We can't compete with the salary that the average guy you know, that has that kind of degree can go out there and make. Superintendents like Vernon aren't just feeling the squeeze in personnel. They're also feeling it from growing expectations outside the classroom. You continually hear we want, we want, we want as a state or a nation, but we're really not putting our, our money where our competing mouths are. If we want more kids in, in college, well then, if we could have more math and science teachers, we could be doing more in those areas, but trying to find a math and, and science teacher in today's world is very tough, and it's not just those two. And with the tighter budget comes renewed calls for school consolidation. A bill set to go in front of the legislature this February would set forth a plan to do away with all the districts in the state by 2020 and instead have one school district per county. Vernon says, not so fast. We seem to forget we've already tried that. You know, whether it's a countywide superintendent, it's been tried, didn't like it. You know, just the idea of, of local control is, is eroding and people don't like that. Their money their, is, is as good as anybody else's money in any other school district or county or city or town. Vernon told us what many lawmakers forget is that communities, especially small ones, take pride in their schools and the students that go through them. I think that's you know, extremely evident in you know, just a, our last bond issue. Our community is very conscious of, of education, very supportive, and there really hasn't been anything that you know, our school, our community has needed that we've not provided for ourselves. The discussion on what to do with Oklahoma's teacher shortage is far from over, and with many other issues on lawmakers' plates this coming session, a full solution may be far down the road. Again, Matt Hendricks. Just getting a sense of the political headwinds with the budget shortfall, I'm not very optimistic that we'll be seeing changes in teacher salaries. It's an uncertain future for the way we develop Oklahoma's future. Well, earlier this month, the Oklahoma Supreme Court ruled a proposed penny sales tax to support teacher pay raises and fund other areas of education can go on to a statewide vote. In a 6-3 decision, the justices rejected the claim the measure is unconstitutional. Now, if approved by voters in November, the one cent sales tax should generate over $600 million annually to help fund education and go towards teacher pay. Horizon is at your fingertips. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to catch the segments you may have missed and our latest new content as it happens. Well, it is understandable that when there are budget shortfalls in state revenue, education is nearly always the most vulnerable. When you add up state appropriations of almost $1.6 billion for common education with the $800 million sent to higher ed and the $128 million sent to career tech system, well, it comes just over half of the state budget, what makes it all too easy to miss the forest for all the trees. These aren't just numbers, but people we're talking about. Students and educators spread all across the state in virtually every community all looking to education for their livelihood, whether it be a paycheck for teachers or the skills learned by students to be able to earn a paycheck. This school year, More Public Schools produced a YouTube video called Breaking the Silence, which features teachers and administrators sharing stories about the difficulties they face. Going to OU and going to college to be a teacher is over $100,000. All of that is in loans. I could not stay, even with the debt forgiveness programs, I couldn't stay and pay my loans and pay rent off of what I'm being offered from Oklahoma District. It's not a system that just became broken overnight, it's something that's been broken. In most professions, at least what I'm familiar with, 
is that you have the opportunity for advancement and significant pay raises over, over time when you've made that your career and your passion, but not so in teaching. If it weren't for my husband's salary, um, he makes, you know, and again, no college education, makes twice as much as what I will ever make, and uh, here I am with a master's degree <laughs> and teacher of the year. Yes, education pays unless you're in education. Now, if you'd like to see the entire video these clips came from, we do have a link to it on our website at okhorizon.com. Are Oklahoma farmers under attack? Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we look at the Right to Farm movement. It provides a privilege for agriculture, and nobody else has that. Right to Farm, Oklahoma show for the heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Thanks for including us as part of your day. I'm Rob McClendon. Hope to see you back here 